Deuteronomy chapter 23. And so if you'll just throw that up there and we'll just kind of go through it like we did. I hope this is helping you guys and blessing you. There's some good stuff, good truth, isn't it? Out of Deuteronomy, it really is. Uh, he that is wounded in the stones hath his private uh, member cut off shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Again, we went over that and it was just stunning when you first read it. I know when I was first got saved, I read that. I, first of all, I couldn't believe it was in the Bible. You know, you, p- people have a really misunderstanding of God. He, he's pretty plain. He created you. Do you, know, you realize you, were bo- you weren't born with diapers on? You weren't born with diapers on. You were born like you was made. Is that right? Uh, you know, so God's fully aware of everything. But this wasn't dealing with as people would think. He's talking about service unto the Lord in positions and offices unto the Lord because of paganism. Okay, so let's go on. We discussed that last time. Ambassador shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to a tenth generation shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. That's a long time. It really meant forever because he was keeping the office, the priesthood. He was keeping the magistrates. He was keeping the legislation, if you will, the enforcement of, of, of that kingdom or the laws and the, the ordinances of God. He was keeping things pure. He was keeping it all within the tribe instead of having the influences of paganism. Okay, he did not want the influence of paganism. Why does that matter for you and I today? Well, it means for you and I, we shouldn't be unequally yoked. We shouldn't be tied into deep business with people who don't really uh, believe like we do. You know, if you hook up with a criminal and do business with them, guess what? You become a criminal. Uh, If they don't pay their taxes, uh, you know, when, when they come for you, Come on, what you going to do when they come for you? Bad, but they going to come. They're going to come for you, for them, and then all the stuff you worked for is gone. So we, we know how that works. All right. So just don't get involved. An Ammonite and a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to their tenth generation. Shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever? Again, why are they not in business, a kingdom business, and part of the the nation of Israel? They didn't take care of Israel on their journey. God doesn't forget those things. He's not a grudge holder, but he remembers those that were supposed to do the right thing and they didn't do it. How does that apply for you and I today? Well, God marks our enemies. Let me try that one more time. God marks our enemies. I don't have to have vengeance in my heart or bitterness. God will take care of them. All you need to do is go to daddy. Just go to daddy. Get on your knees and say, daddy, they hurt me. Daddy, I don't understand. I mean, you know, they're trying to do this. And God will take care of it, all right? He's the great judge. Because they met you not with bread and water in the way when you came out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Beor, of uh, Pethor, of Mesotobia, to do what? Mesotobia to what? To to curse thee. Yeah, to to curse it. So you, you you can't curse what God has blessed, let me try it again. You can't curse what God has blessed. So when people curse you and I, just it's like a big shield. Bing! It just flies off of you. Now, the words hurt, and we go through emotions and all that, but if, but if they're really trying to curse you, it can't work. It doesn't work. Okay? Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam. There it is. He wouldn't listen. But the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee because the Lord thy God loved thee. So the love that God has for you and I turns our cursings into blessings. Jesus talked about, he talked about that. You're blessed when people speak evil of you. The glory of God comes on you when people persecute you and do the wrong thing. Isn't that good? How many of y'all feel a lot of glory on you today? Uh, <laughs> I mean, you feel a lot of glory because you're being persecuted. You're going through stuff, okay? But the, the, the key here is not to act like, like a Job mentality or a lion, you know, lioness and Charlie Brown. Why is everybody always picking on me? We can't do that. We have to just say, you know what? God's going to take care of me. I don't like it, but he's going to take care of me. I don't like the situation. Verse six, and thou shalt not, uh, thou shalt not seek their peace and the prosperity all the days forever. So God dealt with them. Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite for he is what? Thy brother. That's family. And thou shalt not abhor in Egypt, 
an Egyptian because thou wast a stranger in his land. Remember that, that the, the difference between the Egyptians and the others was Jacob went in there as a large family, but he became a what? A great nation. So Egypt was considered a womb, a birthing canal for the nation of Israel. And God never forgot that. Isn't that powerful? So God, God will even, he'll even deal with your enemies kindly at certain times. So, you know, we just, we just let God you know, just do what he's going to do. Because we don't understand the whole plan. You ever been in a situation, and I want to just kind of put this together, because I've been there too. You've been in a situation where it seemed like your enemy was prospering, even though you prayed for them. But see, God was using that enemy to bless you. And out of that obedience of what they were doing, God ends up blessing them too to do what? The goodness of God leads men to repentance. That's why we have to step back sometimes to say, I don't know what you're doing, God, but okay. That's why you, do not, you and I don't have the right to sit there and say, well, I curse you. And I'll... May your knees grow together. You don't do, that's witchcraft. You should never do that to your enemy. I don't care how, what they've ever done. You say, Father, handle it. Bless them. Do what needs to be done. And the God will take care of it. If he wants to make their knees grow together, he will. Maybe he'll give them a third knee. You never know. All right. <clears throat> the children of the begotten of them shall enter into the congregation of the Lord in their third generation. So there's a little bit of penalty, and then they're in the congregation there. In power, they could be in leadership. When thou goest forth against thine enemies... Uh, then keep them from every wicked thing. Pretty good advice, don't you think? If there be among you any man that is not clean by reason of a cleanness that uh, uh, chanceth him by night, then he shall go abroad out of the camp and he shall not come within the camp. So we know about that. That's, that's nocturnal emissions. Uh, but it shall be when evening cometh, he shall wash himself with water. When the sun is down, he shall go into the camp again. Uh, how many of y'all believe that that God is a God of purity and a God of holiness. This is why the prophetic community has said for years, and I know we said for, for years from this place, uh, our military is in trouble. And any military of the world is in trouble if you allow sin in the camp and you allow sin to be there, and then you're going to go out and fight and then say, God's with me. You better get clean. You better put the cross back, all right? Thou shalt have a place also without the camp, whither thou shalt go abroad, go forth abroad, and thou shalt have a paddle. Woo. Have we all thought about that after we, that we, we did, we talked about it at the house. We were talking, we, uh, we, what were we doing? We did something. I said, you bring your paddle? Remember, that's a nail or a spike. It's basically like we'd have today a shovel. Come on, somebody. If you're going to go camp and bring a shovel with you. Some of y'all say, I'll just bring a Winnebago. A Winnebago. All right. Thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon, and it shall be when thou goest to ease thyself <laughs> abroad. Thou shalt dig therewith, and thou shalt turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. Good idea. Amen. Can y'all do that? Cover it up. Why? Because the Lord walks in the midst of the camp to deliver thee. He don't want to do what? Walk in your mess. You give up thine enemy before thee, therefore shall thy camp be holy, and uh, there shall be no unclean thing. So we see that cleanliness is next to godliness, like we were told, right? Mom and dad were pretty much all right, grandma and them were right. Uh, so God says, I want you to keep clean. Good ideal. All right, so let's go on. Thou shalt not deliver unto his master the servant which is escape from his master unto thee. You just go on, keep going on there. Just talking about doing the right thing. You don't oppress, you don't oppress the servants. Uh, when you make a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not be slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will do what? He'll surely require it of you and it will be sin to thee. Do you think that applies to New Testament? Yep. yep. Absolutely. Let your yeas be yeas and your nays nays. You know, be careful what you say to God, especially when you're in trouble. Yeah, we've all said that before. Said, God, if you just get me out of this, I'll become a priest or whatever, a nun. Is that it on that? All right. So let's get into tonight's teaching. 
And uh, I know, man, I've made a lot of, lot of vows, and, uh, and the Lord reminded me of that when I got saved. Maybe that's why I went to Africa. No, I'm just, I'm messing with you. All right, are you ready? Deuteronomy chapter 24. Deuteronomy 24. Moving along in this book. And so let's, uh, let's talk about this here. Okay, in verse 1. When a man taketh a wife, and he married her, and it come to pass that she has no favor in his eyes, because he's found some uncleanness in her, let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. Now, first of all, in this word there, uncleanness, it is not the same as you would think like adultery or something like this. This is really, really bad, really impure. The word uh, there in the Hebrew really describes it as something very unclean that she might have done. We really don't have the understanding other than what the Hebrew word means. The reason why we know that it doesn't apply to just adultery is because there was a test, test for adultery. Remember that? Took it to the priest. They drank a little bit of potion. If her thigh started to rot it out and her belly got real big, she lied. Is that right? If nothing happened to her, she had a nice little smoothie. Remember that? Okay, so that's, that's not the same. This is something that something very lewd that she possibly has done. Okay, so then I'll explain a little more in just a minute. Verse two, and when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. I want you to notice verse one and verse two, something you might not have caught there, but notice how it says his house. It's his house. And there's two reasons for that. One, obviously the male dominance of, of that time you know, uh, number two, the fact that man was supposed to be the provider of the house. Now, it doesn't work that way today. It, it doesn't. We, we're getting murdered with taxes. A house has cost too much. It's very hard for one guy, just, you know, whatever, to have that job and that ability to go out and buy that home. Normally, when people hook up and get married, they do it in, in a, you know, hotter than a Texas pepper. Come on, somebody. And they'll sleep in the car until they get a mobile home. Come on. Back in the day, you're supposed to court, and the man would go and buy a house or build a house. When he got it ready, he'd go get her, marry her, and bring her through the threshold. It don't work that way. We live in mama's basement, grandpa's garage. Come on, somebody. Somebody's barn because we want to be together physically, and we don't have that standard anymore. But it used to not be that way. So there was two understandings. I don't know if you caught that about his house. Uh, that don't work now. It's all hers. <laughs> Come on, ladies, help me. And if you don't believe that, you ain't been to divorce court or a good lawyer. All right. And if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and give it to her, uh, her hand and sendeth her out of what? His house. Or if the latter husband die, which took to be his wife, let's go on, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife after she is defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for inheritance. Okay, so why, why was this brought out? The reason it was brought out, it wasn't that God was, was allowing divorce and wanted to divorce. It was the fact that the men's hearts and, and, the, and the, the, the people of that time, their hearts were hardened. They would just allow it to take place. So Moses had to put these things into operation, but they were not to be, you know, it wasn't to be something that was uh, lackadaisical. Okay, so when we read that, we say, wow, you know, it seems like things were rampant, but go to, go to Matthew chapter five. We'll just look at a few things in, in the, uh, the New Testament. We're not going to be teaching on marriage, remarriage and all that. It's, it's just, why did God, God, why was he saying, I don't want you to do this. I don't want you to go back and forth. He was trying to keep the harmony and unity of the marriage of the unit. Okay. 
but he knew of their hard hardness. He knew how they were. That's what Moses, it says it perfectly, uh, talk, talks about what Moses had felt about it. So go there, Matthew chapter 5, I believe it's 31. And it may just be a couple verses into that. You there? It's been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him uh, let, give her a writing of divorcement. Go on. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, his wife for saving calls of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. And then I think, let's go. And again, you've heard it that it's been said by him all time, thou shalt not f- uh, for swear thyself, but shall perform all that the, that basically, what did I say? The Lord, uh, thine oath. So you're supposed to keep your yeas, yeas, right? Do what you're supposed to do. So let's go to Matthew 19.3 real quick. Matthew 19.3. And the Pharisees came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Why were they doing that to Jesus? Because what I just read to you in Deuteronomy was still happening up until his time. See, Jesus came to correct things. He came to bring a new law. He came to bring grace. He came to bring a better understanding. Okay. And he answered and said to him, have you not read that which has been made at the beginning, made them male and female? There he is. He's talking about unity. He's talking about keeping that together. And said, for this call shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, there are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Okay, so we go back to Deuteronomy. So we see it in the light of the New Testament and, and that's not my teaching for tonight. It's just as an understanding historically that their hearts were hardened. And so this was put into uh, the understanding of what was going on in that time. All right, so what's the next verse? Verse five. When a man taketh a new wife, I don't know what he did with the old one, but he taketh a new wife, he shall not go out to war. Why why, why doesn't he go? He shall not go out to war, neither be charged with any business. Why doesn't he go out to war? Because he's going to have his own battle when he gets home. No, no, I'm just kidding. Brother Mike, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, He doesn't go out to war. It's just the way God establishes it. Why? Because he did not want the man's mind on war, uh, on on the home and all that. He wanted it on the war. You know, you got to be thinking about that. And business. We talked about this in a couple chapters before. But I threw that in there. Okay, when a man taketh a new wife, he shall not go out to war, neither shall be charged with any business. But he shall be free <laughs> at home for one year. Wow. And he shall cheer up his wife, which he hath taken. I laughed at that. I said, really? It's going to take more than a year. <laughs> I, th- I said to myself, 25 years, Brother Tony, I've been working on that. Oh, man. Somebody, we better check King James. That translation might be a little off there. Woo wee. No. But anyways, it, that's the way it was. It was the truth because at that time period, you look, you, when you get married, you, you got to have a honeymoon, right? Here in America, because we work so hard, you know, we get two days, three days, one night. We go to, you know, we go to Memphis or something like that, and that's it, you know. You go to Graceland, and you come back home, and you're married, and you got to go to work. Well, they, remember the, how, how I told you that they have their wedding feasts. They could last well into a month or more. And then so that whole year was getting to know the spouse, building the house together, falling in love with each other, blah, blah, blah. That goes on with marriage. And, and it, was, it was a good thing. And I think it was a wholesome thing. Wouldn't it be nice to do that? Amen. That doesn't work today, right? I mean, you get married and it's I do and you got to go to work. Yeah, you got to go to work. You can't live off a little bit of the honeymoon money. The wedding money, but that doesn't last long either. All right, so, and no man shall take the nether or the upper millstone to pledge, for he taketh a man's life to pledge. Now, this is really cool as God begins now talking about, you know, money and lending and things that, and it becomes really important. And these, these, these verses all the way down to end 
that they, they, they touch me deeply because uh, of, of the poor. But, but, but read this here. No man shall take the neither or the upper millstone to pledge, for he taketh the man's life to pledge. Well, what does that mean? Well, basically, in that time, in that fr- time frame, when they made corn, they made corn ready to eat. They made the meal ready to eat. They didn't have it like we do and put it in a pantry. They didn't put it away. So they made their food for the day. And usually these millstones were, made, were hand millstones where they could operate them by hand. Well, when they would come and do a pledge for a loan, if you handed them the millstone, the top part or the bottom part of that millstone, then you took away their daily bread. They couldn't eat. They couldn't make the supply of the day. And God says, you're not going to do that. You're not going to take away the substance of how they eat and how they live. And that's why we have to be very careful with interest. We have to be very careful with signing our lives away. Help me, church, with car payments, house payments, and all kinds of payments to where your life is now become a slave to those to whom you owe. Do you see that? God doesn't want that for you and I because what if we can't pay? Then our life is gone. Does that make sense? And most people have no life. They can't, they, they can't have a life because they're trying to make a living. They're trying to make a living. They keep living. But God wants you to have a life and enjoy it. Life more abundantly. See, we all think that that's, you know, Jesus is going to pop us on the head with, 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 a, with a royal scepter and we're all going to be blessed. No, he wants you to use wisdom and then he'll bless you. He'll bless your wisdom if you use it. He'll bless the wisdom that he gives you. And one of the things is, is not to become a debtor, not to become enslaved. And I, don't get condemned. We all have bills. Wave at me. We all have bills. We've made decisions or what have you. But having said that, we can look forward and say, Lord, help me to get out of these entanglements the best I can. And then don't be stupid when you do get blessed and go out and put yourself in more debt. I was talking to someone the other day, they, they got to build a brand new house and then they got a brand new Lexus. And I giggled and I said, uh, I said, laughed. I said, well, I ride a bicycle. You know, I was just kidding around because this person was, you know, really blessed and all that. And I'm, I said, how long you got to pay? Five years. And then I giggled even more. I mean, you know, you get what I'm saying? If you have to do it, you have to do it. But if you don't have to do it, don't do it. Get a rent a wreck. Get a rent a wreck. All right. No man shall take. Wait, boy, you are fast, girl. No man shall. T- I was going to go over it again, but you're, <laughs> you're too fast. The upper mills, she wants to get away from that part. To pledge for taking take of the man's life. To, okay, now I'm ready. And if a man be found stealing any of his brethren out of the children of Israel, really the word stealing there, is, it should be translated kidnapping. Any the children of Israel, so don't kidnap. And maketh merchandise of him and selleth him, and him uh, that thief shall die, and they shall put away every evil from among you. That's pretty plain, isn't it? You kidnap, you steal like that, you're going to... Die. Problem solved. No prison over overcrowding. <laughs> Take heed in the plague of leprosy that thou observe diligently to do according to all that the priests, the Levites, shall teach you. What does leprosy represent? Leprosy represents sin. What happened to Miriam? We can go to Leviticus chapter 13, I believe it talks about leprosy and how the priest takes care of it. And then in Numbers, it talks about Miriam. But let's, let's go on. Uh, as I commanded them, so shall you observe to do. So you got to go to the Levites. All right? Remember what the Lord thy God did unto Miriam. What does the name Miriam mean? Rebellious. By the way, after you were come forth out of Egypt. So what did she say? She said to Aaron, hey, we can hear for God ourselves. We're just like Moses. And God says, okay, get out of the way. So we have to be careful about that, that we don't don't try to usurp God's authority and we do the right thing. I'm going to try to find you that uh, I gave you Leviticus 13, didn't I? And I believe it's Numbers 
Numbers chapter 5, but you can go back and research it and, and, and see where that is. Yeah, Leviticus 13 and Numbers 12. Boom, Numbers 12. Go back and look at that when you have time so you can check out that story because it's a pretty amazing story. And what that does and for you and for me, it, it, it reminds us that you know, if God has a delegated authority, then we need to respect that and we need to be careful with our tongues, uh, with anybody, even our brothers and our sisters, okay? When thou doest lend thy brother anything, thou shalt not go into the house to fetch his pledge. Now, this is where it starts to really, really get me because this, this right here is God saying, I do not want repo. Amen. I don't want repo. He really wasn't into that. Now, we are today, especially if somebody owes us something, I mean, we're ready to go in there and not only rip the TV off the wall, we're going to go ahead and take the couch while we're there. How many of you know what I'm talking about? People just that vindictive. But he says, when you lend to your brother anything, thou shalt not go into his house to fetch his pledge. Again, the guy makes a pledge. What does that mean? It basically means this, and it'll be more clear in a minute. Uh, you loan me money and I give you something in exchange just like you would do where? At a pawn shop, at a title loan. You ever notice those things, a payday place? It's not fair. It's not fair. You borrow a hundred bucks, they want a thousand back if you mess up. You know, you, you, you wanted something small, they want something large. And so it's never fair when, when that capitalist mindset, but God wasn't that way in the beginning. He didn't want that, okay? So how does that apply for you and I today? I think it applies the same way, that if someone owes you something, yes, we have laws, we have courts, and there's the right way of doing it. You can go get the sheriff and all those things. But if you can, work it out among each other. Do the best you can with the brother. Sometimes... Sometimes you have to walk away. I'm not telling everybody to do that because I don't know your situation. I don't know the amount of money. I don't know how big it is. But sometimes the Holy Spirit may say to you, you know what, son, it ain't worth it. Just let it go. I've done it many times. You have too. For all kinds of money and merchandise and materials, whatever. God, you know what? God's blessed us beyond we can imagine. So whatever. Okay, thou shalt stand abroad and the man to whom thou lend shall bring out the pledge abroad unto thee. So you basically go to the brother and say, I'm here to pick up my, my pledge. I'm here to get my loan. I'm here to get what's paid back. I don't go in his home. I don't violate his space. Isn't that so opposite of today? It really is. It really is. You got cousins and brothers that, oh, we'll go jump them, man. We're going to go jump them. All right. And if the man be poor, well, this touches me, thou shalt not sleep with his pledge. Okay, so what does that mean? If the man's poor, now, okay, what does that mean? It's very simple. That when they made their pledge, as I told you, there was an exchange. If the man loaned money, the man who got the money, the poor person would give his cloak, would give his coat in order to exchange and say, this is all I got. And you got to understand something. In the Old Testament times, that was everything because the cloak was the outer tunic. It was the outer wearing, the outer robe that represented the totality of who they were. And based on how nice it was, you could tell whether they were first-class citizen or they were a beggar. Boy, I could really preach on this about Jesus and the beggars and, 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 and all those different things, but there, there was a level of poorness and so when he handed over that cloak to him, he basically was handing his life and his identity to him. Wow, man. And God is saying, you don't go over there and take his identity and sleep on it. In other words, if he didn't pay you back that day, you go give it back to him. Here's another reason why. is because the cloak is what they slept with. They didn't have necessary blankets like we do. And if they had the blankets, the cloak was a part of their outward covering as well. Remember, that whole outfit was their identity. Wow, man. 
If any be a poor among you, thou shalt not sleep with his pledge. In other words, you're not going to take his pledge from him. Why? It's going to be cold. It's going to be bitter cold. Think about our system, how rude and how, how, how vicious we are. And our government and repos and banks and, you know, I got it. You wrote on that line and you promised the money. I understand there's a penalty before it. But, but, but I tell you, it's rough. We've gotten so far from the heart of God. You owe what you owe, I got it. In any case, thou shalt deliver to him the pledge again when the sun goes down. Fix it. That he may sleep with his own raiment and bless thee, and it shall be righteousness unto thee before the Lord thy God. Boy, how much more righteous could we be? And how much more could we see the grace of God and the glory of God on our churches and our homes if we just be more benevolent to people? I'm not talking about being foolish and as the, as the world would say, sucker. You heard that all your life. Don't be a sucker. No, I'm talking about just being loving and being caring for one another, especially to the household of faith. Okay, the world, it gets a different standard many times, but especially the household of faith, man. All right, and thou shalt not oppress a hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of thy brethren or strangers that are in thy land within thy gates. What does that mean? Just do the right thing. Just love people. It amazes me when, when you go to a restaurant and how rude people are to waitresses. I don't care if you're giving them a tip. Your tip probably ain't 15% anyways. You, you'd be surprised how people, when the, when the tables are churned and now they serve in you, you act like a lord and master over them. Come on, somebody. You shouldn't be that way. No matter what color, no matter what culture we come from, none of the, we should love them even, evenly. I can't stand that stuff. And his day... I like this here. In this day thou shalt give him his hire, neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is what? Poor. And he setteth his heart upon it. Man, doesn't that break your heart? See, payday was supposed to be every day. Some places still pay by the day. I think that's a great policy. I don't know how it works for accounting. Jennifer, probably not the best way. It probably drives them mad because you can't keep track of things properly, but but I know some people, I know some people in business that actually do that today. In construction, they pay by the day. But, but regardless, you know, systems have changed, life change, economies change, world changes. But, but look, look at the heart of God here. For he's poor and he set his heart upon it. Lest he cry unto the Lord thy God and it be a sin unto thee. How many people do people wrong? Well, I'll pay you when I'm ready. Or whatever. You know, we live in a cruel world. We really do. How many of y'all ever been stiffed? I have. I've been stiffed in the house of God. Before I got up to preach. Before I stood up to preach in front of several, probably a couple hundred people were in there. The pastor announced to everybody, he said, the offering is not going to this preacher tonight. <laughs> So I got up there and preached like a man from another planet. I preached as hard as I could, laid hands on anything that moved. You know what? God took care of me, brother. He's still paying me. Whew. But, I mean, do, can you see God's heart? Then why do we act so, so, so rough sometimes to people, especially with money? All right, let's go. Before I, all right. And the father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. So in other words, I'm not responsible for what they do, vice versa. So God threw that in there through Moses. And thou shalt not pervert the judgment of the stranger, nor the fatherless, nor take a widow's raiment for what? To pledge. How many of these slicksters, you know, they... A person comes in there to a title place, a pawn place or whatever, and they're, they're destitute, they're divorced, they got children or whatever, and they just charge them 25% interest. You know, this, that stuff's wrong. 
this stuff's wrong. You know, if you need to make money and you have, have to have interest, whatever, I think it should be on a level scale, you know, whatever. The world's got its system, but that's rough right there. Okay. Why? Because thou shall remember, everybody say remember, that thou wast a bondman in Egypt. Now, this, this is for you and I. I have to remember that I was a sinner, I have to remember I was in bondage. I got to remember I was poor in spirit. I got to remember I was broke. I got to remember these things about my life so that when I do that, I understand the power of grace. And then I'll tell you, when I read this, I I almost was in tears. This is how much it touches me because I realize what a debtor I am to God for what he's forgiven me of. And how could I hold that against you? How could I hold it against anybody? How could I look down on the sinner? How can the church do that? How pious and and, and hypocritical can the church be? God forgave you. You were in Egypt. Wow. The church needs a spanking. I'll tell you that right now. Just put put over daddy's knee, daddy God's knee, and just let him whack a couple good times. And let them boo-hoo it. But thou shalt remember thou was a bondman in Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee thence. Therefore I command thee. No, I ask you. No, I command you. Do this thing. Does it apply to the New Testament? You betcha. And when thou sittest, uh, or thou cuttest down the harvest in, in thy field. This is another thing that just rips me apart. And thou forgot a sheaf in the field. Thou shalt not go again to fetch it. For it shall be for who? The stranger and the fatherless and for the widow. We talked about this in a couple chapters before about taking care of the poor. But God says when you go to do your harvesting and you forget, quote, no farmer forgets. No farmer forgets his harvest. But let's say you did forget it. I don't, you know, I'd, I'd guarantee a, a farmer don't go, did I have 150 cows or 142? I wouldn't, no, they know how many cows they have. So it's a little tongue in cheek, but when you go through your harvest and you finish your harvest, leave something for the poor. And what does that mean for you and I? How does that apply for the New Testament? Well, we're not farmers, but we have money. We give, we have tithe, and we're supposed to give our offerings. So that's the part of our leaving behind for the poor. That when we give, when we give to the house of God, that a portion, a piece, a part goes to the poor. Okay, under his direction uh, uh, by the Holy Spirit. But but wow, could, could you see what community he was trying to build and what love and what unity? That God may bless thee in all the works of thine hands. You know, I really believe this. This is just my personal opinion. I believe that if businesses would give to the poor, their businesses would explode. Not just their offerings and tithe like that stuff to the church or whatever, but if they would do, if they owned a paint and body shop and they blessed the widow, or if they took out part of their, their yearly giving and they did something extremely for the poor, like bought food or, 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 or cooked you understand what I'm saying? Uh, there's people we've known. We've we've had a dentist in our church here who 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 gave free dentistry. You know, God blesses businesses like that. What if we just did that? Why don't we just have like an amnesty day? You know, where our businesses gave away to the poor. Wow, I think God would really bless us. And when thou uh, beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the bowels again. In other words, you beat it one time. And that's what you get. Whatever comes out, you take that rod and you beat it. How many of y'all ever tried to take down, uh, what was it we used to pick all the time? Pecans. How many of y'all ever shook a pecan tree? Man, I've sh- Carla, come on now. We've all, I made some good money on pecans one year. In fact, we were so, we were so poor, those pecans got my children their Christmas gifts that year. When, when the church wouldn't help me, denominational people, uh, the Lord took care of me with a tree. Come on, somebody. 
When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the boughs again, uh, and it shall be for the stranger, the fallenness, and the widow. Man, that, that just touches me. Let it be for them. I don't like to see anybody poor. Do you? I really don't. I don't like to see people poor. I don't like to see people struggle. Uh, not everybody's going to be a millionaire, but we can take care of people. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterwards. In other words, don't, don't strip it bare. It shall be for the stranger, for the followers, and for the widow. Now, do we know of a story where that, that happened? Yep. Ruth. Ruth chapter 2. Happened for her, didn't it? Right. Well, Jesus did it for us as well. He gave us the whole vineyard. He gave it all to us. It's all of it. He gave it all. He said, here you go. This is mine. I want to share it with you. Come on in. You don't get a portion. You get the whole thing. So why don't we give portions? And I'm not talking to this church. This is a great church. This is a given church. I'm just talking to folks, you know. You know, instead of blowing people up over the world, why don't we start dropping food? And thou shalt remember... <laughs> And thou shalt remember thou was what? A bondman in the land of Egypt. Therefore I command thee to do these things. And I wrote in my notes, grace. Just real big. I, this, is, this is grace right here. This is grace. This is what God wants you and I to do to those that are in need. And so that was it. Verse 22, is that right? That's all she wrote on that. How do, we, how, do we, how do we reconcile? How do we put this in New Testament terms? How do we end this? Basically, in Deuteronomy 24, we're supposed to do the right thing by people. We're supposed to see the heart of God right here, that he's a giver. And we're supposed to remember where we were. Not all of us, you know, have lots of money and we're millionaires and we're famous and we're this and we're that. We're all... Uh, st striving, we're struggling, we're working, doing the best that we can. But in light of everybody else, some of us are doing much better than many. And if you look at us as Americans and you compare the world and what they're going through, I mean, you know, if you've been anywhere overseas, they look at us as kings. They look at what we have as like, oh, wow, if I could only have that. Uh, I believe the church's responsibility is to be givers. And not only overseas, but also around us. And always remember that because you were a debtor. You were in trouble. You were in Egypt and in bondage. Father, thank you so much for this message tonight. I pray that we would, we would not just articulate it and just learn it and go home and be fluffy with knowledge. But we would be, we would be doers of the word. We'd be givers. Lord, hungry bellies have no ears. And Father God, we need to remember that in this coming days. We need to understand there'll be many people sacrificing in the coming days. But I pray that the church would have plenty and that we would give to the fatherless, the widows, and those who are poor among us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I love you guys. I'll see you Sunday morning. Bye.